Hi everyone, and welcome along to Sonic Academy with me, Chris. Today I'm joined by an American producer and DJ who's nearing the end of a very, very long tour here in uh, Belfast Limelight. He has released, in my opinion, one of the best albums of 2018, uh, Little by Little, on his own label, This Never Happened. Would you please welcome to Sonic Academy, Daniel Goldstein, better known as Lenny. Hi, Daniel. Hi, hey, you? how's it going? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know it's a really tight schedule. You're at the end of this. It's a pretty mammoth four months, five months tour. Are you looking forward to the tour finishing? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, I really love playing shows and the only thing that I'm really looking forward to is getting back in the studio and having a bit of downtime to make music again. So you've been on this tour for four months. I mean, it hasn't been like a weekend here, <coughs> fly back home. It has been solidly away from home, away from studio. We, we do go home sometimes, like if it's close to home, yeah. um, which is in Denver and Colorado. And if it makes sense, scheduling wise, we'll go home for a few days. But kind of knowing in the back of your head that you're going to have to pack up in one or two days, it's not that easy to kind of unwind and get into music making mode, at least for me. Yeah. Um, so. For me, I need like weeks or month, preferably months on end where I can kind of sink my teeth into new ideas. So, um, so when you're in the studio, I mean, do you need to, it, it's not, you're not one of these guys that can sort of come off the road, straight in the studio, do a few hours, come back on, go on the road. It, it kind of, you need to, to let production breathe and your ideas breathe and sort of develop. Yeah, I mean, it's, I have done that in the past. Um, like I'll, I can do a remix like in a weekend, for example, like that's pretty, pretty achievable for me. But like when it comes to doing original music, it tends to take me longer. And I tend to just not even try to start if I don't have enough time to actually finish something in one sitting, basically. Do you, would you produce on the road? Did you? I used to more. Um, yeah. It's hard for me right now. Well, um, that's going to lose <laughs> right? it, It's hard because you've brought your family, uh, a very young, yeah. you're, you've got a new child, young baby. Yeah. I mean, that's, 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 I'm sure promoters, when you land, they're going, okay, do we yeah. need a car seat? And, uh, so how's that been? Yeah, it's been great. Um, I mean, I mean, first and foremost, like we're the luckiest parents because she's so easy. Mm -hmm. um, she's really, really sweet and good natured. Um, so that makes it really easy. Um, and the only really downside is that she wakes up at like seven, eight o'clock in the morning. So if you're out until three, four a.m. Yeah, yeah. playing a show, um, then there's no chance of sleeping in. But aside from that, it's it's really fun. Like I get, I don't have to miss her yeah, like yeah. growing up and. Um, she also like, you know, when we're just bored in the airport, like we just watch her looking at planes and shouting yeah, at yeah. people and it's just kind of constant entertainment, so it's great. And I suppose you can do it now before she starts school and then it, it, yeah. you're not going to be able to do it. Yeah. And what about sort of even the logistics of when you land in the city and trying to get nappies and, you know, things like that, is it, is it difficult? So we like, we have sort of like a, a game plan for diapers in different parts of the world. We know which diapers are available. So like <clears throat> in, here in the UK, for example, I don't think they have like the specific type of diapers. So we'll always like bring a ton extra if we're going to be in the UK. Um, this interview's taking a very weird turn. Yeah. Just, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> <laughs> so. it's, but no, it's, it's just, I think it's very fascinating to do. I think it's kind of, it's, it's, it's the normalization of DJing has become so, yeah. you, know, it's, it, you know, rock stars in the 70s would have taken their kids on tour and you know that. So it's, you know, it's, it's a continuation of that. Yeah, it's, I think so. It's, it's brilliant. And it allows you to relax and, and then, you know, enjoy what the tour is about and yeah. know, sort of get into the shows. Uh, Will you be glad to see the end of the tour? Will you be glad when it's over and just you know want to get home? And are you down to get back into doing some music? Some yeah, definitely. I think that, and also like because of the way the, the kind of circuit or whatever you want to call it works, like you're always like going from doing a bunch of club shows and venues to then festival season and back to doing venues and stuff. And I feel like whenever I get to the end of festival season or club season or whatever it is, I'm always looking forward to what's coming next. Yeah. So right now I'm excited like for festival season to kick in and like go do some outdoor stuff. And that's back in America, you'll be doing just sort of... Yeah, some in America and some in Europe. Um, so I mean, that's where Do you see a difference season. country to country from America to Europe to Australia? Are you, what, yeah. What, what are the differences? Um, I think in Australia, the fans are really just crazy and rowdy like in a good way they're very energetic and um, I think they also appreciate like when artists do make it all the way down so far and yeah. people don't come there that often um, 
And I think same goes for a lot of places where um, you know artists don't come multiple times a year. So we just did a show in Manchester, which is, as far as I can remember, the first real headline show we've ever done there. Mm -hmm. um, and I could kind of feel that they were like excited more than you know in, in you know, say like New York, where I've played like 15 times. Yeah, yeah. Not that they don't like come out and, and show support there, but. Um, it's a di it's a slightly different feeling. There's a hunger for yeah you know, yeah definitely. Sort of appetite for for your music. Let, let's let's talk about the album a little by little. Let's, it came out well back in February, was it? January, yeah. January, January, and it, it's been you know it's been a big success for you. You have done it on your old lab, your own label. This never happened. Mm -hmm. Was that a tough decision to do that, or is this is this been the game plan always? It was, we started the label in, in 16 with just like a run of single club tracks and it was just sort of an experiment to see if, if it would work. Um, I've always, is it just doing the innate stuff or was, was there all Yeah, I mean, until recently we hadn't done any outside artists on, on the label, so it was just like an outlet for my music um, and it was just something that I wanted to do as an artist, um, just to have my own thing um, and not be dependent on other you know, other factors really yeah, yeah. And have kind of have complete control over it. And like those few singles that we did were picking up so much momentum um, that it was kind of pretty easy to just say, okay, we're just going to keep doing all the late night stuff through This Never Happened um, because it just works so well. Um, but when you, you've been on labels like uh, Angina Deep, yeah, that's a big label yeah. to sort of go, no, I'm going to do my own thing. Is it? Uh, that's not hard for you, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer, you don't know this is what I want to do. I wouldn't say it was a no-brainer. Um, there was a lot of like internal debate yeah, and yeah. Uh, hand-wringing about it. Um, but, you know, like, I, I also, I'm managed by the, the same people behind Engine Adib, so they have a management company as well. Um, so I still work really closely with them, and I think I still enjoy a lot of the same benefits, even though my music is coming out on a different label. Yeah, yeah. Um, I still enjoy the benefits of like a really great team kind of putting their efforts behind my music. And, and would they, <clears throat> so that management would get involved in the making of the album, even though it's coming out on your label, they would help you source singers and yeah, absolutely. Get, get, you know, get these together. I wanted to talk about some of the, you know, the, the tracks on the albums like Skin and Bones and uh, Little by Little. I suppose the first thing is there's some sort of club tracks or instrumental tracks mm -hmm. and then there's, there's pure songs. Yeah. How do you approach the song? Do you write the song? Do you get somebody in? To, do you collaborate? Uh, it kind of depends. Like with, um, you know, I've done a few songs with Solomon Gray, yeah. um, and that's always more of a collaborative process. So like we've done songs where they wrote a bit, and then I would kind of add my instrumentation. Um, we also did songs where I just like wrote everything, and they basically just came in and sang it. Um, on this album, it was. Yeah, most of the songs were more of a 50-50 collaboration, so Skin and Bones, like you mentioned. Um, Patrick just sort of had that song written, um, and it was pretty much ready to go. Okay. And he just sent it to me, and I really liked it, so I just built sort of track around that. the whole track around mm -hmm. around an already finished vocal. So it, it just gets singer in, have you got anything, have you got anything, yeah. you back and track, yeah. Yeah, and see if it works, and if it does. Yeah. And, so you've written whole songs on your own then as an mm -hmm. artist, you've, you've, that's because it's something I couldn't do, you know, I couldn't, yeah. I, I completely and solely relied on singers. To be fair, I don't want to make myself sound like very prolific, I did that I think once. <laughs> cut, cut. <laughs> no, that's, that's all you need to do. Uh, so, let's talk about production, it's, how do I describe, I can't, I've been struggling all day to try and think how to describe your production, it's, 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 just what's there is right mm -hmm. and it's not bombastic it's not just you know that was the first thing that struck me your drums are all they're not they're not loads of processing going on no. not loads of trickery and no. big reverbs and stuff they're very dry they're just there they just they're serve the purpose is mm -hmm. that is that a conscious thing or is this yeah i mean the dryness of it is definitely conscious i think that you know when i first started making music um I tended to put drums in spaces and, yeah. and echoes and all that kind of stuff because when you're just noodling around by yourself on small speakers, it sounds kind of cool. Um, 
to have you know a clap in a big space or a snare drum in a huge space or yeah. whatever. Um, and once I started playing like out more, um, I realized that when you play music in a room, like that is the space. Okay. for your drums. So I don't like to have any like additional reflection happening on the drums because wherever you play it, it's just going to like weird uh, to the reverb. like oddly clash yeah. with with the natural reverb of the room. Uh -huh. um, so I've always found that it just the music just sounds better when when the drums are dry. At least club music. Yeah, yeah. Is, so. um, and what about the instrumentation? What I mean is there modular stuff going on in your tracks or is it all in the box? Um, I use a sub 37, that's the only thing. Okay. Um, and I've got like a little, um, what do you call it, Nord uh, keyboard as okay. well. Um, but most, yeah, most of the synths are just in the box. Um, what, what's the go-to synth? What's the... Um, I have a few. Uh -huh. It's It kind of depends like what I'm after. Like for bass right now, I tend to use um, Diva. Okay. For like chord, pad kind of stuff. I use a lot of serum at the minute. Okay. Um, I also use that for like arpeggios and that kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that is a big stamp of Lineate is the arpeggio. Mm -hmm. It is the sort of quirky, and it, the, the arpeggio, some of them sounded modular to me. It was like, so you've, you've definitely got that sound. Do, do you do a lot of sound design? Uh, or is it very simple, what you, it's again, functional, what you need to do? I like to just like, pick one or two, maybe maximum three things to modulate like with automation mm -hmm. and stick to that. Like I'm not, I mean, it's obvious if you listen to my music, it's not like overtly complex. It's pretty like, it's pretty straightforward. But I think if you have elements that move around and change mm -hmm. enough, that can kind of keep the listener interested in I, that. I know he says not overtly complex, but it's actually, it's the hardest type of music to make, yeah, I think, think. because it's it's so easy to kitchen sink and throw reverbs and throw more at it and, and let's get a bigger chord in here and let's do a, a clever change here and stuff. Yeah. And it's it, just stop yourself doing that and go. Do you know what? What's here is right. Yeah. And what's here is good. And that's that, that that's kind of a very much a takeaway I took from it. it was like, well, yeah, it's you know, this is just, what's there is right. Yeah. There's no there's no frills around it. There's no bullshit around it. You know, yeah. it just keeps going. There was one. Uh, your track, The Midnight, that's been huge. Mm -hmm. Massive plays on, on the spot. What, what is it about that track that resonated, do you think? Um, I think it's just like one of those tracks where like the main memorable sequence starts yeah. like really quickly and is catchy. Yeah. Um, it's crazy like how, what the kind of like streaming numbers that it yeah, put up. It's, 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 I, like I don't know, <laughs> I have no idea. It's cool like I mean at the same time I think like the the other track that I've done that got a lot of streaming um, action was Fingerprint yeah. which is like mind-blowing for me because it has like a minute and a half of drums at the start. Yeah, yeah. And I figured like you know everybody says like with streaming oh, it has to have a big dynamic change in the first five seconds or whatever. Okay. Um, which Midnight like fits perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Fingerprint's just like a club track. I like, think with it's like it. five million plays and stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. got like a good ton. So. What door do you use, by the way? Ableton. Ableton, so you're sitting on a blank Ableton mm -hmm. screen. Yeah. What's the first thing you do? Is it uh, grab a serum and start arpeggiating? Is it grab drums? Is it loops? Is it what's... I usually, yeah, I mean, the arpeggio comes first a lot of times because, like, I like to have <clears throat> in a lot of my tracks, I'll start with like a pretty static arpeggio okay. that's just like one, two, four bars, whatever, whatever it is, but it doesn't like really change that much. Right. And I'll move the bass line around, like, to create that sort of, um, yeah, the musicality of the track will be mostly driven by the bass line and the chords. Uh -huh. um, and the arpeggio might just stay the exact same for the entire seven minutes or whatever. Um, but I find like once I get an arpeggio going or, you know, a chord sequence going um, that I like, then I'll start to do like the sound design on it and try to, because I'll usually start with like a pretty basic initial patch. Yeah. Um, and then I'll start messing with filters and effects and everything later on. <clears throat> have you got a secret weapon plugin? Is there some sort of little thing that we have not paid attention to that we need you do? <laughs> do you <totally> no. do? <laughs> I mean, I think my, I think the secret weapon is like just not being afraid to use like a lot of processing, especially on, on soft synths. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think like soft synths for me sound really 
shitty. Uh -huh. um, and it takes a lot of effort to make them sound good. Okay. And a lot of, I think a lot of what I do is trying to like take stuff away because soft synths are like very maximal and like you have every frequency, mm -hmm. um, including some really nasty ones. So like the first step is just EQing out all the stuff that sounds crappy. And then um, like the space is really important and then, uh, then effects and I think like what I'll also do is just like do weird things like I'll render like a, a loop of something yeah. and then play with it with as audio or, or resample it or whatever. Um, so render sort of bit of weirdness or yeah. sense and get a tail and a reverb. Yeah exactly because I, I think that's a lot of times where you get the most interesting sounds is like not just straight playing out of silent or whatever it's it's actually putting in the work and what, what are you doing for your EQing, for those surgical EQs? Um, Fab Filter a lot, and Waves Renaissance EQ a lot, and the Ableton one, just the stock Ableton one. And what about drums? Is it single shots, or are you bringing in loops and chopping things up, or...? All single shots, yeah. yeah. And are you ranging on the timeline, or into a drum rack and MIDI, or...? Both. Both. Let's move on to, then, uh, your DJ. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you, you, are you tempted to do a live thing? Are you tempted to bring the studio out and start? I would like to. I mean, it's, I really like DJing, mm -hmm. so, and it seems to be like working really well, and I don't necessarily want to like upset the apple cart, because okay, yeah, yeah. it feels like we're kind of on a roll with DJing. Yeah. Um, I do like playing live. I'm not sure about like doing entire tours of just being live. I think it's a brutal, life yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah I've, I've seen like friends who do live um, shows and and how difficult that is mm -hmm. um, so I think like I could see myself in the future doing like special events like where I do something more live like a one-off yeah like a festival appearance yeah being it live and something <clears throat> no no plans to do yeah it. Uh, or do a and then above and beyond sort of unplugged sort of thing. Yeah, that I mean they've I think they've done that pretty well. They have. Um, I think no, it's, it's worked really well. And, yeah, but obviously their their main thing is still DJing, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they have like sort of a dessert course, yeah. um, which is the acoustic thing. I think that's pretty pretty clever. So, what's the the one plugin that you couldn't live with? Live without? <laughs> that I couldn't live with. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's the one if you? are you had to take one with you, but everyone else has, you, you have a door. Yeah, um, probably Diva. I think it sounds the best. Okay. Like, as far as just being able to create sounds just out of a soft synth that really sound really good, right. um, I think that's the one. Like I've, it's crazy, because I use synths so much that I actually hate, and I like, <laughs> that I don't think they sound good at all, but I, I can get it like close enough and then all the processing comes in and it sounds like halfway decent. What monitoring are you using then? Just... Um, at home I use the Dyn Audio um, BM8, okay. I want to say. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the booth, the 15s in, in our main studio, they're, they're lovely. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, yeah. I love Dyn, I'm a big fan of Dyn Audio. So, what's the plan for 2018? What's the rest of the year hold? I really want to try to kind of get the label going. We've signed a bunch of music from other artists. Um, and so trying to promote some music that's like been really key for me. Like I've done, I do these seasonal mixtapes on SoundCloud and just been sent like so much good music that's, that has been a key part of those mixtapes. Um, and I want to kind of try to get some of that music out there in the world and start supporting those artists. And is it start the next album? Is that a plan or is it take a break now? Just sort of um, I mean, it's in the back of my mind, okay. but I haven't taken any like concrete steps towards it yet. Yeah. So go home and have a summer summer back in Denver, is it? Yep, yep. This is Dan, thank you very much for joining us. This yep, time. thanks for having me. Guys, I uh, hope you got something from that. I uh, hope you enjoyed watching Daniel uh, chat about his productions and we'll see you all very, very soon. Thanks everybody for watching, commenting and indeed liking. We really do appreciate all the support we get here on our Sonic Academy YouTube channel. So if you find this video super useful, please We'd love you to hit the subscribe button. We update the uh, YouTube channel every week with new content. And if you want to watch some more relevant content, just click on the videos beside me.